I was, uh, I was hoping y'all weren't expecting me to sing the lines to that or whatever, but. So we've been on a series walk this way, and our team has been waiting for five weeks to pull one of those. So uh, just having some fun in church. Thank you for participating. My name is Pastor Phil, and if I didn't get around to introduce myself personally, I wanted to thank you for joining us today. This is service number two of our th- of three services over the course of the weekend, and um, we really are having a great time. I, 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 even though we're in part number five, the final talk of our series, uh, it, you'll, you'll be able to extract some things out of today's message, I pray, that we would be encouraged, uplifted, and, and ready to take on the week, the year, and, uh, and that my prayer, our prayer for you has been that God has set us up divinely, that he has an assignment for you as much as he has for me, and as much as I'm here to communicate, I'm here to receive, just like you, and so may God meet us right where we're at, Amen. All right, so how many this time of year, maybe the fall it started and it's creeped into winter, where you pull the crock pots out a little bit more often than, than, than you used to? And, and have you ever noticed this? Like sometimes I'm, I'm a bit, historically I have been known to uh, be a bit impatient. And um, I just want to be careful how I speak over my life because I am not, I'm not going to declare that over me. But historically there's been times that I, I wanted to get from point A to point B quick. And if you take some soup or some stew and you, you put it in a bowl and throw that baby in the microwave, you can have that thing heated up in a minute and a half. I mean, the container itself is so hot, it burns the fingerprints off of your fingers. But as soon as you place it down and you took one little stir, it's still cold in the middle. Yeah, if you go home, like maybe some of y'all got some crock pot dinner going on today, and, and you, you could go home, take a scoop of that, put it in a bowl, go walk the dog, do the laundry, get cleaned up, change your clothes, come back, stir that thing, and it's still hot all the way through. What's the point I'm trying to make? Here's, here's my opening statement. God is more concerned with our consistency than our efficiency. You see, you might think you're getting there on the fast track, but if the center of you is still cold and you're not cooked thoroughly through, then, then really have you accomplished what he wants us to be accomplishing. And, and if we think of us uh, in a microwave world that God actually wants to do some pot, crock pot cooking in our lives, consistency is a big deal to God, and it should be a big deal to us. For this talk, I'm going to spend most of my time in Colossians chapter 2, though I'll be deviating, coming back and forth from it, because how many know getting from point A to point B isn't always a straight line, right? So I'll come back to Colossians 2, but let's begin. Colossians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, Paul writing in verse number 1, he says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have in your behalf, and for those who are at Lady Osea. And for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love. Someone say love. Love. I'm going to finish the verse here in a moment. But he says that over the church, the saints, the body of Christ, that we be knit together in love. This is important because he could have said knit together in our politics, but he didn't. He could say knit together in the color of our skin. But he didn't. He could say we could be knit together by our traditions and our denominations, but he didn't. What he said is his prayer for us over the church, even being spoken across the age, is that we be knit together in what? Love. Love. Let's continue on. And that they would attain to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. One of the things that uh, is a trap for religion, it's, one of the, it's, it's, it's a strange dichotomy because it's, on one hand, it's, it's attractive, and on the other hand, it's a bore. Why is, it, why is religion sometimes attractive? Because there's things to memorize, and once you know it, you know it, and then you can boast about it. In fact, you, could, you can outknow someone else about your tradition. Okay, so there's, there's an attraction for people to say, hey, you know what, I don't, all I want to know, give me the five rules, give me the ten standards so I know what to do. You know, there's no faith required in that. There's actual faith required in trusting Jesus to do a work in you and allow salvation to work out of you. So there is an attractiveness to, to tradition or religion to some people, but the other part that makes it boring is that once you heard the story, you heard the story, Right? I mean, I, I'm sure that none of you have ever been guilty of this thought, but we do have three services, and those other two services are rascals, so pray for them, okay? But, 
But, if, you know, imagine, you know, I get up here and I say, I'm going to be ministering today from the Gospel of John, chapter 10. And you're like, ah, oh, I've heard that before. As if there's nothing more to learn. As if there's nothing more to see. And here's the thing, the beauty, the excitement. I'm a thrill seeker through and through. And so this Christian journey is right up my alley. Every time I discover that there's more treasures hidden in him, I get more excited to find out what else is in him. You see, we started by faith. We respond to Jesus by faith, and we receive everything there is to receive. But how many know there's a maturing and a growing and a developing and discovering that still takes us not only through this lifespan, but we're going to spend the rest of eternity discovering all there is to discover about God. Let me give you an illustrative point on this one. Uh, not to put you on, the, on, on, on point here, Craig, but Craig, you've been in the, the service here since worship, right? You've been here listening to my message already, right? Do me a favor. Would you reach underneath your chair and see if there's something stuck to the bottom of your chair? What do you got there? What's in that? Is that a $20 bill? Nice work. How many else are looking underneath their chair right now? What's the point I'm trying to make? Did that envelope containing a $20 bill show up the moment that Craig found it, or has it been there all along? And the same is true for Christ. There are so many things that are already there, and they've been there all along, but he's invited us into this amazing journey to discover these treasures and unlock these moments. It's, I'm like a, there's, there's two things in my life that really get me jazzed. Number one, finding those aha moments within Scripture. Finding something that I didn't see before, and the only thing that's better than that for me is telling somebody else. <laughs> like, I leave here on Sundays thinking, I cannot wait for next week because I got so many things I want to share or things that I want to talk about, and they put 30 minutes on, this, on the counter, and I got to get through it. And There's so many things to discover. If you think you've scratched the surface, you haven't seen anything yet. Let's go back to Colossians. Colossians 2, verse number 4. Paul goes on to say, I say this so that no one will deceive you with persuasive arguments. For even though I am absent in body, I am nevertheless with you in spirit, rejoicing. Rejoicing in, uh, to see your orderly manner and stability. Your orderly manner and stability of your faith in Christ. I'm telling you, if there's ever a letter to be written by a pastor to their church that he would want to say, it would be, I rejoice over you, not because you're a bunch of weirdos, not because you're a bunch of fanatics, but because of your orderly manner and stability. If your spouse could write a note to you, the, I'm telling you the most important thing they would want to say is, I rejoice over you for your orderly manner and your stability. If the world could put a sentence together, the unbelieving world, that they would ask of the church, they would say, thank you. We're excited, rejoicing over your orderly manner and your stability. The best influence you will have in a chaotic world is to be stable when everyone else is losing their mind. We are called to be an island in a sea of chaos so that those who are drowning in all of the information, all of the distractions can see that there's a stable person in their life. And I believe God sent you to that workforce, to that office, to that school, to that neighborhood to be stable in a really weirdo world. Look at your neighbor and say, be stable, please. Come on, we need it. Stability and order. One translation doesn't say order or stable. It says the D word, discipline. <laughs> you know, we're midway through February, second month of the year. I bet you all of us at some level, whether you wrote it down, you thought it, I'm going to do some things different this year. I've got some goals that I'm going to accomplish. Maybe, maybe these are resolutions that you're going to do. I'm also going to guess that there's some of those items on your list, like me, that we're not crushing it yet. Or maybe we've deviated from. Maybe, maybe they've fallen off. You know, the good news is it's not too late. We can pick back up where we're at. The reason those goals were important then is the same reason they're important today. Because in this life, stability and order and discipline is the biggest impact that we can have in a world that doesn't know what stability looks like. 
But when we talk about discipline, especially in a grace church, a Jesus-centered church, a gospel-centered church, we can, we can get some pushback. Like, listen, you, it's a fine line to be talking discipline up there, Pastor Phil. Don't you dare sneak into legalism. Hold on. I like what Dallas Willard has to say about this. He famously said, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Grace isn't opposed to you getting involved, you yielding, you having effort. Grace is opposed to you thinking that you could earn it or somehow deserve it. And that's where the, the, that's where the difference has to be made. That's where the line has to be drawn. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God isn't unstable. The Holy Spirit brings stability. The Apostle Paul, who writes about the gifts of the Spirit in the, in the book of Corinthians, he also writes about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. The difference is huge. You see, the gifts of the Spirit can only be received by faith, but the fruit of the Spirit are a result of what you do with your faith. Let that sink in for a moment. I love that Ben talked about all of the agricultural terms because it leads into a perfect uh, uh, segue for me. You have to plant the seed in the soil for it to grow a tree. You have to tend to that tree and give it water, give it sunlight, tend to these things. And it's what you do with your faith that produces the fruit in your life. Galatians lists all of the fruit of your life. So yes, Paul says you are supposed to have fruit. He did not say you're supposed to be fruity. <laughs> and God knows there's a difference. Let me show you an illustrative point all the way back to the opening verses in Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the, of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Three words that I want to point out here. The first word being uh, form. Without form, it means chaos. The second word was void. It means waste. And the third word is darkness, which means obscurity. I think the Lord is showing us what it looks like when he found us. He found us in the darkness. We were he found us in the chaos. He found us in the voids. And when the Spirit of God came in, in verse number three, if you continue to read the, the creation story, he began to create, bring order to the chaos. When the Holy Spirit goes into your life, he's activated in your life. When you allow him into your life, he shouldn't make you, he doesn't make you, a weirdo, he makes you stable, a person of order, someone who's confident, someone who has ability, someone who can demonstrate what it looks like to have peace when it doesn't make sense. Colossians 2, let's go back there to verse number 6. Now Paul says there's some action that we should be looking into, or action required. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. In the same way that you've believed on Jesus as Savior, you now need to walk with him or walk this way. Because there's a, there's a real danger. Spiritually speaking, we, we, could, we, could probably, we could find ourselves in this posture where we're sitting on our blessed assurance, <laughs> waiting to go to heaven. And that's true. Faith in Jesus secures eternity. But the plan of Jesus was to bring heaven to earth, and the only way that happens is if we, the same way that we receive him, we walk in him. This means that it's more than just what happens in your life. It means it's important what happens through your life. Author and speaker Dennis Waitley once said, personal development is the belief that you are worth the effort, time, and energy needed to develop yourself. When you commit to personal growth, discipline, walking with him, what you're actually saying is, I agree with what God thinks and says about me. Because God thought you were worth sending his son for. God thought it was worth redeeming you so that you could experience wholeness and oneness and union with him. And when you actually believe that and you commit to a life of discipline and order and walking with him, you're just cooperating with him. You know, here's a good opportunity for me to, to say there is a true humility and there's a false humility. A false humility is saying, well, I'm just, I'm just a dog. I'm just a worm. I'm not worth anything. Listen, it's, that's a false humility because that is not what God says about you. That might be what you feel about you, but that's not what God says about you. He says you're a son, you're a daughter, you're a beloved 
that you were worth everything. He bankrupt heaven for you, for me. And so committing to growth and development is actually aligning with true humility, saying, I might not feel this way, but I believe that God says this about me. And so more than just receiving him by faith, more than just being a believer, I'm going to walk in him. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. One of my favorite verses. How many know it would be weird if we, we started giving a eulogy to you while you were still alive? Kind of awkward, right? When is a eulogy given? At death, at a funeral, right? There's no, I'm not, there's no, there's no catch here. So the point he's making here, you have been blessed. This is, this is past tense. And the word blessed here is where we get our English word for eulogy. So the blessing that's already been given to you isn't because you died. It's because Jesus died. We have too many Christians waiting for an inheritance. We call it heaven. Listen, you don't get an inheritance when you die. You get an inheritance when someone else dies. And Jesus died for you. He blessed you with every spiritual blessing. Here's the kingdom privilege. He doesn't say, hey, here's the goal. You work hard. You, if you do good enough, you'll get there. As if it's your strength, your ability that's going to get you anywhere in him. But instead, he, he set you up. He set me up. He says, I've blessed you with everything that you need, not only for eternity, but for now to live in this. This was his philosophy when he was talking to his disciples. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse number 7. He says, and as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, he's saying the kingdom of God is at hand, but you still have to reach for it. It's still an act of faith. Everything that you need to live and walk in him, he's given to you. Go all the way back to the time of Moses. Exodus chapter 16, verse number four. He says to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you, manna. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them to see whether they will follow my instructions. In other words, he's saying, look, the manna fell from heaven, but it didn't fall in their mouth. They had to go out and receive it, collect it. You know, we have a father who, who we read within scripture that gives us perfect gifts. And we, every good and perfect gift comes down from the father of lights. He's gifted us with everything that we need in Jesus. But just like having the $20 bill taped underneath the chair, it's there, but until you appropriate it or until you obtain it, until you apply it into your life, you may not ever experience any of these promises of God. Every recorded, for the last 5,000 years, recorded human history, and, and, and as far as anyone can tell, every era, every generation has had its own challenges, unique to their generation. And every generation always thinks that theirs was harder than the one that they have it today. You, you've heard the stories, walk to school both ways uphill, in the snow, you know, no shoes. I mean, it just gets worse and worse. Every era, this generation, the generations to come, will have its own challenges. It will have its own uh, particular to that people group, but we're all going to face them. And the circumstances is what evens the playing field. My circumstance might be different than the circumstance of my grandparents, but the reality is their circumstance was hard. And, and regardless of who's in office, regardless of what's going on in the economy, regardless of what's going on, if it's a famine or if it's a feast, if it's a health condition or it's a healthy time, if it's a marriage or a disposal of marriage, whatever it is, the circumstances are circumstances. And the devious thing about this is it leads to excuses. And the terrible part is your excuse is valid. You might really have a challenge before you. And the problem with using excuses is this. When you're good at making excuses, it's hard to excel at anything else. You either look for excuses or you look for a way. Circumstances are circumstances. And your circumstances aren't revealing, uh, let me say, or say this right, circumstances don't make the man. Circumstances reveal the man to himself. The pressure, the squeeze, the discomfort, the challenge 
is just revealing you and what you really think. Let's say it this way. Your theology is unmasked in crisis. What you really believe will come out of your mouth. What you really believe will come out of your actions. What you really believe will come through the way that you plan under crisis. Now, don't be, listen, there's times, hallelujah, praise God, that the squeeze comes and the best possible scenario comes flying out of my mouth. There's times in the squeeze that the best possible response is exactly what I do. But there's times when the squeeze and the crisis and the trauma, my knee-jerk response isn't something I'd always want to say or my actions. You, you don't have to allow the enemy to whisper that that makes you less than. Listen, we all have challenges. We all have struggles. And when we blow it, when we mess up, we fess up. And then we move on. And we keep walking in him. Someone say amen. amen. Because there's going to be times in your humanity that you're not going to knock it out of the park. There are challenges that we face that are, that are um, external. We're not going to get around that. And if we leave this place thinking that we have to control everything, well, we're going we're gonna to lose our minds. Let's, let's think of it this way. A wise man doesn't try to steer the river. He steers himself. You can't control all your circumstance, and you can't control the people around you, but you can control how you respond. You can control what you do and how you move forward. And you're not just left to try to figure this out by your own, you know, pulling your own bootstraps up, but you're empowered by God to do something different that you couldn't do without his help. Walking in him, Jesus, means that we're going to have to leave some things behind. Leave some things behind. Really, it's going to look like creating new methods and practices. Kerry Newhoff, in his latest book, he's an author, uh, speaker, used to be a pastor in Canada. He, he said that this way, it's virtually impossible to create, or excuse me, to crave something that you've never sampled, smelled, or experienced. It's nearly impossible to crave something that you've never sampled, smelled, or experienced. By a show of hands, has anyone here ever tasted one of Mindy's cheesecakes? Okay, I'm telling you, it's probably what we eat in heaven, okay? <laughs> Amazing. But if you've never tasted one, how are you going to crave it? And here's the thing. We, we, uh, we, let's go back to the, the New Year's resolutions and goals and plans. There's probably a good chunk of us across this room that made some health goals, that, that made some plans that we were going to either get back in shape or we're going to do this or that. And, and, uh, and we're not always hitting it out of the park, Right? And, and since you can't start a diet on, on Sunday, you got to wait till Monday, right? Isn't that like a law or a rule or something? So, so let's say Monday cometh, and it does, and, and you decide, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm getting back on track. I, I, I'm not going to eat the cheeseburger. I'm going to order the salad. And then this little voice inside goes, you're a hypocrite. You really want the cheeseburger, and you're just eating the salad. Or, or let me ask you this, the moment you decide to get disciplined about what you put in your mouth, does that mean the cheeseburger stops tasting good and you all of a sudden crave salad? And I'll get off the topic because I know it's touchy for us all. The point is this, the craving of something different, the motivation, you know, Jesus said where your treasure is, your heart will follow. Meaning that until you put your time, talent, and treasure towards it, your emotions won't connect to it. Then in her book, The Five Second Rule, Mel Robbins talks about the myth of motivation, which I completely agree. I think it's a myth. If you're waiting to be motivated to change your situation, motivated to, to change your circumstances, your systems, you're going to be waiting a long time. Let's think of it this way. If I have a bonfire going, uh, the fire doesn't get hotter before I put the log on. It gets hotter after I put the log on. That's essentially what Jesus is saying. If you want that motivation to show up, that passion to burn within, it's not going to show up on the front end. It's going to take you stepping out by faith, putting a log on that fire. And then it's amazing how the passion will burn, the motivation will burn. But the truth is we're going to have to move away from some things, some systems, before you feel it. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 2, the final verse of this, this section of passage I want to refer to. 
Paul writes, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. A week ago Saturday, we had a, a No Regrets Men's Conference. We simulcast the event. And they had multiple speakers from around the nation. And one of the speakers that caught my attention was Pastor Dave Dummett, who is the senior pastor of Willow Creek Church. And he, he used the redwoods in California to, to make this great point. If you're not familiar, they're the oldest species on the planet. They're the largest trees. They're, they're, they're so wide that you can actually drive a car through them. They're, they're, they're tall and, and gargantuan and beautiful. And what they discovered was that the root system under the trees isn't sufficient to hold that kind of weight. It's not sufficient to, kind of, to hold that tree to the ground when the winds come and the storms come. What keeps them together is that the trees around them, their roots weave in and out of each other, and together they hold them to the ground. And when he began to speak about that, I thought, that is exactly what the church looks like to me, the body of Christ, to be rooted and established and built up. In the body of Christ, it's not about being best on the team, it's about being best for the team. What you do, how you live, how you conduct yourself really does matter. One of the many definitions that you'll find about the word consistency, I, I like this one within, within Webster's. He's, it says, harmony of parts to the whole. One of the definitions for consistency is harmony of parts to the whole. Think about it this way. We are the Father's symphony. And together, we make beautiful music. But if you have one rogue instrument player, I'm full of illustrations today. I'm loving this. Interesting, just like that, how it disrupts the flow of us all. So you might be thinking, look, I'm, I'm okay with believing on Jesus. I'm okay with the fact that uh, I'm, I'm secure for eternity. And I appreciate your desire, Pastor Phil, to motivate us and encourage us to live differently. But look, how I live is up to me, and it only affects me. Wrong. That is absolutely wrong. What you do, how you live matters. We're counting on you. We need you to be rooted, to be stable and held together. And you need us to commit to the same. And the world needs the church, the body of Christ, to be strong, stable, and in order. We are called to be the stable place when the world is chaotic and the winds and the waves come, and they do, that this will be a safe haven for people to come, not to fight and not to bicker and not to insult and not to hierarchy and not to jockey for position, but to hold one another together, even in our differences. If you could put that verse number seven back up, the final words that Paul writes is, and overflowing with gratitude. How do we live this life overflowing in gratitude when there's so much that wants to make us angry and mad and rob away from our peace? The way that you can do it and you will do it is through prayer. The primary sound of prayer is thank you. It's thank you because Jesus has already provided every spiritual blessing in him. And so we thank him. We're grateful. We may not see the answer yet. We might not feel the answer yet, but we say thank you. Prayer is important. Prayer is where we, we trade in our microscope for a mirror. Jesus said, be very careful about pointing out the log in your brother's eye excuse me, a speck in your brother's eye when you have a log in your own. It's in prayer that we stop looking at everyone else's faults and failures and we allow the mirror of his word to reflect on us and we humbly say, thank you for your grace. Thank you for helping me. It's within prayer that we trade in our plans and we receive his vision for our lives. Our very own Steve Relier in a training of our security team said this, and I, I, I've, I've went back to this quote many times. He says, your body won't go where your head hasn't been. 
Now, he was talking about running through scenarios, uh, emergency scenarios, and he's, he's right. If you haven't been through the motions, if you haven't been there in your head, your body won't respond. I thought this is what it looks like in prayer because your body, your life won't go where you haven't already seen in prayer. Now, here's the danger when it comes to prayer. It's really easy to get lazy. It's really easy to say, I'll pray about it. Oh, I'm praying about this decision. I'm praying about this. I'm going to pray for that. I'm going to pray for this. Listen, that is only half of the equation. Matthew's gospel, uh, chapter 26, verse number 41. Jesus says, watch and pray. Someone say watch. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This word watch comes from an, an old Greek word that means a watchman. They would put watchmen at high points within a, a fortified city. They would watch the horizon for their enemies. They would watch the horizon for their, 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 their family, those that are part of them. So what he's saying here is that we need to be people who pray and watch, pray and respond. Let me end with this statement. Want shows up in prayer, expectation shows up in behavior. Meaning we should be praying. We should be hearing from God. We should be downloading what, what heaven is saying over our lives. We should be praying over our loved ones. We should be praying over our church and our community. But, but we also need to put our behavior where our expectation is. We need to watch and pray with expectancy. Don't let prayer become an excuse or a place to be lazy. Because there's, it's too easy for us to pray for the co-worker. Pray for our family member. And I wonder if Jesus is whispering back by his spirit saying, you show them. You tell them. You model it. You allow order and consistency in your life. It's taking on what he's empowered us to not only believe, but he's taking, well, he's taking on what we believe to affect how we live. Last Friday, we were making a trip to Grand Rapids. We, I'm excited to tell you that we finally bought a, a new box truck for our food pantry. We raised the money through the, through the golf outing. Um, we raised money for it, and we went over to buy it. Well, we picked a doozy of a day to drive to Grand Rapids. It, it was, it, the roads were pr pretty bad. About every two miles, we saw a car either freshly in the ditch or a car waiting to be pulled out of the ditch or a car being pulled out of the ditch. And I um, I was getting a little bit arrogant. I'm not going to lie. I'm thinking, man, these are terrible drivers. First time in winter, huh? Goodness. And I'm getting more and more in my head about it until I went to change lanes and the back end of my truck kicked out. Recovered, but it was a humbling moment where I realized, you better watch yourself, boy. You're going to be in the ditch yourself. You see, that's another image for us. If we don't Watch the things that we're thinking about, allowing the Holy Spirit. You see, we start our day or end our day hearing from God. It's the moments in the day that those come back to us. I used to work in an environment that this company brought people from in all over the world. And it, I would go into different floors, different labs, different facilities, and they'd all be listening to different music. And I didn't realize how much it was affecting me subconsciously until I, I left one of the labs. I get on an elevator, and about midway up the building, I'm singing every word to a Britney Spears song. <laughs> Not my normal jam, but it got in there. And that's what was coming out of my, the melody of my mouth. Well, if it can happen in a way that's not so great, no offense to Britney Spears or her music, but... What about the melody of heaven that we get downloaded from God and throughout the day, it becomes so natural that subconsciously it's just coming out of you. So when the squeeze comes, and it does, when the pressures come, and they will, it doesn't have to be something that we have to muster up. It becomes a, a knee-jerk response from the time that we spent walking with him. Amen? Amen. I think we are just so in for a great opportunity. You know, 
I encourage myself in the Lord. If you stand with me, I encourage myself in the Lord in this. There are some pretty unique challenges of our day, some of which I wish I didn't have to address and some of which I wish I was in a different era. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but I I wrestle with these things. But here's my encouragement from me to you. God knew that we would be in this era, equipped and ready for such a time as this, that in the world that seems to be going in all kinds of different directions and no one has absolutes and and no one has certainties and no one has this, this confidence that's needed, we know that confidence has a name and we can walk in him and we can shine bright in this, uh, the darkest of days. And I, I really do believe, and I'm not big into like using language like revivals, but I think that if there's a word that comes close to it, I think that we could be in the midst of one if we have the right focus. And I'm talking more about just a scheduled event at a church. I'm talking about a nation that has turned unto their God, under their Savior, because of what they see in his sons and daughters. So Father, cross is true. Whatever the circumstances and events that led us to this moment, I believe you set us up, that we're here on purpose. We're here to worship together. We're here to hear your word together. Most importantly, we're here to encounter you. And so we make room, we make pause here. Some of us, there are some systems and there are some some things in our lives that need to be adjusted. We need to to walk away from, but more than just walking away from something, it's walking into something better. And so we, we yield and we surrender to you. We want your help. We need your help. We want to more than just believe. We, we want to live in everything that you say about us. For my friends here today that Perhaps this is their first time or they feel far from you. I pray, Father, for an atmosphere of courage. That this would be a moment where everybody would feel safe to say yes to Jesus. Yes to the one who's come to save, to rescue, to make us whole. Yes to the one who's already forgiven our sin, that's invited us to a newness of life, So we don't just say no to our past. We say yes to our present as we yield to you. And more than just a gathering on a Sunday morning, more than just an encounter, a religious moment, if it doesn't work on Monday, it doesn't work on Sunday. And so we need you every day, every week, every month. And we want to walk with you. We want to follow you. Thank you for empowering us with your spirit that is our capability to do what we could not do in our own strength. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.